Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're looking at a video on the Reasons for Hope channel, because that Juan Valdez video from last week made me a bit nostalgic for them. This video is part of the Glad You Asked series, which appears to be an answering viewer questions series, and is clearly geared toward younger viewers, with an obvious attempt to appear more hip and with it. I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. Anyway, in this one they're talking about evidence that supports the idea of intelligent design. Let's go! So Nick Smith asks, is there any evidence to support that life is complex enough to require a designer? That's not really a great question, because the thing is, complexity is not necessarily indicative of design. Good design will only be as complex as is necessary to get the job done. So from the fact that there is a lot of needless complexity in biological organisms, we can infer that if they actually were designed, the designer is mm, suboptimal to say the least. Now, this in and of itself is not evidence against intelligent design, but it is evidence against the idea that the designer was all-powerful and all-knowing, as such a being would have been able to implement a more efficient and effective design. And Nick, glad you asked that question because it's one of my favorites, because I grew up going to a public school where they taught me that there was no evidence for intelligent design, that Darwin had figured everything yeah. out, and that we were a product of a great cosmic accident. I just find it so deliciously ironic that he can say stuff like that while wearing a shirt that says because lies enslave, the truth sets you free. Because the thing is, well, it's not impossible that he somehow wound up in a public school that actually did present evolution in that way. It is way more likely that he was in a school where the teacher was forced to begrudgingly teach a bit about evolution in order to meet the requirements of the curriculum, but mostly just ignored it, or even presented arguments against it in class. Now, to make this absolutely clear, neither the scenario that I described, nor the scenario that he described, is an appropriate method of teaching evolution. The teacher should not ever mention intelligent design in either a positive or a negative light. Because while I do believe that the evidence is very much against us having been intelligently designed, such beliefs fall into the category of religion, and public school teachers should not be promoting or discouraging religious beliefs. That's what separation of church and state means. Now, if you happen to get a teacher that actually did teach in a way that doesn't touch on religion either for or against, and you took the information from that class to be a refutation of intelligent design, well, then I guess intelligent design is refuted. Because evolution is a fact. The Big Bang is a fact. The fact that the universe is 13.7 billion years old is a fact. If you don't believe in these things, then your beliefs are factually wrong. And so my stick, can I jump on a soapbox for a, a second? Bit, go ahead. All right, I'm going to jump on a soapbox. Teach evolution in schools if you want, but teach intelligent design alongside of it. Yeah. And let the students figure out what they think makes more sense. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Religion has no place in public schools. Intelligent design is based in religion and runs counter to the facts. Now, if you personally want to believe that God intelligently designed us through evolutionary processes, that's fine, I guess, nobody's gonna stop you. But there is no evidence for intelligent design, and especially not a version of it that doesn't include the theory of evolution. In fact, the vast majority of creationist arguments don't actually provide any evidence for creationism. They are just feeble attempts at poking holes in the theory of evolution, or the Big Bang, or geology, or whatever other science they are against at that moment. I'm going to make a prediction here. I haven't watched through the whole video yet, but I can pretty much guarantee that the main line of evidence for intelligent design, if you grant it, won't actually get you to the conclusion that life was intelligently designed. If I hypothetically take their entire argument at face value and accept it, you just get to a point where we know that whatever thing they are talking about did not come about through the process of evolution. They then wish to extrapolate from this the conclusion, therefore God. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. If you manage to definitively prove that evolution is completely impossible, then all that says is that we need to go back to the drawing board and figure out how life got the diversity that we see today. It doesn't end at an intelligent designer. For that, you need to actually bring positive evidence to make your case. And evolution can't explain it, 
is not evidence that positively makes your case. At best, it is evidence against evolution, and that's it. So until you actually bring evidence to the table that supports intelligent design, there's no reason to teach intelligent design in the classroom. Also, what version of intelligent design do you propose we teach to school children? The Muslim one, perhaps? How about Last Thursdayism, where God created everybody last Thursday, but preloaded with memories that make it seem like we've existed for our entire lives, and with a bunch of evidence that the Earth and universe are actually billions of years old? If you wouldn't want these versions of intelligent design taught to your kids, then why do you think your version should be the one that gets taught to the non-Christian kids? Some are going to believe this way, some are going to believe this way, but at least you've given them the opportunity to do it, because at this point, in public schools, it is so dogmatically taught that students aren't given the chance to intelligently make a decision mm -hmm. about their faith. Public schools are not places where they are supposed to be taught faith. Faith is not a good method of coming to accurate conclusions about how the world works. Faith is what you use when you don't have evidence backing up your position. As the Bible says, it is the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen. When you have evidence, you don't need faith. And conversely, if you need faith to believe something, well, then you probably don't have evidence for it. Otherwise, you'd believe based on the evidence, not on faith. And creationists know that faith is not a good epistemological foundation, because they will often accuse people who believe in evolution as having faith in a derogatory manner. There's probably someone in my comment section right now that didn't get to this part of the video, but is talking about how I have faith in evolution. So we both know that faith is bad. Since we both agree that faith is bad, can we not also agree to keep it out of the publicly funded classrooms? And hell, even the private schools should be required to teach their students true things that are evidence-based. Like, fine, I guess let them teach about religion in the private schools too, but they should still get a comprehensive and fact-based education. Irreducible complexity. I know you think that's a big word, mm -hmm. but irreducible complexity. And yep, irreducible complexity. At its core, an argument from ignorance. We don't know the evolutionary explanation for X, therefore there must not be an evolutionary explanation for it, therefore it was designed. So argument number one from him is, as predicted, not actually evidence for intelligent design, but is at best just evidence against evolution. It's not actually evidence against evolution, but if it were actually a valid argument, then that's all it would amount to. And really all that means is it's irreducible like, by one part. Yeah. And think of a rat trap. You have to have a wood base. Mm -hmm. What else do you have to have? A little spring mechanism. You gotta have a slap band that, you know. Don't forget the cheese trap. The yeah. cheese trap, yeah, yeah, that's very important. Oh god, you'd think they would have come up with at least one new analogy in the 17 or so years between the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial and the publication of this video. Because the thing is, as was explained both at the trial and a million times since then, it's not always about removing a piece and then having it retain its current functionality. Evolution will often take existing structures and change their use. For example, the mammalian middle ear bones evolved from what used to be jaw bones in our early synapsid ancestors. So yeah, the most basal form of the middle ear bone could be considered irreducibly complex, as long as we insist that it perform a function related to hearing. But if we allow for the fact that previous iterations of it were a structural part of the jaw, then suddenly it's no longer irreducibly complex. Ken Miller demonstrated this principle using a mouse trap at the Kitzmiller vs. Dover trial by showing up to the trial wearing the mouse trap as a tie clip. He had removed the bait holder and the catch from the mouse trap, which makes it useless as a mouse trap. But in the same way that our middle ear bones were previously quite serviceable jaw bones, it was still possible to use this mouse trap as a tie clip. If you took away one of those parts, would it work? Absolutely not. No. no. Maybe not as a mouse trap, but it'll still work. And really, this is an area where complexity actually works against your argument. Y'all like to say that we know life is designed because of how complex it is, but then you argue that such and such a thing couldn't work if even one of its parts were missing. But the more complex something is, the more potential uses that thing could have other than the one that it is currently being used for. Think of it like a Swiss Army knife. A Swiss Army knife is more complex than a regular old knife. But if you remove the knife part of the Swiss Army knife, you can still use it as tweezers, a nail file, a screwdriver, a bottle opener, can opener, corkscrew, hook remover, scissors, etc. The complexity of the Swiss Army knife makes it reducible. Because it's irreducibly complex. complex. Yes, yes, you have to have all of its parts functioning all at the same time in order for it to be functional and working. Otherwise, it's useless, okay. right? Mm -hmm. No, not useless. 
just not useful as a mouse trap. So how does that apply to us, though? So I'm glad you asked. Mm -hmm. Eyeballs. Eyeballs. <laughs> like what? Yeah. Eyeballs are irreducibly complex. No, they really aren't. Like not even a little bit. That's probably one of the worst examples you possibly could have chosen. The evolutionary path that led to eyeballs has been known for long enough that Darwin himself had part of a chapter of his book dedicated to explaining it, and he got the explanation mostly correct. If, if you have an eyeball, you have to have a retina, a cornea, an iris, a cornea, protective a cornea. lens. Yeah, you have to have a protective lens. You have to have orbital muscles. Yep. You have to have basically over thirty yeah. parts, basic parts, uh, just rods, for it to work. Rods. Yeah, you need all those things for the modern human eye. But there exist in nature today organisms that have eyes without lenses, organisms without corneas, organisms without orbital muscles, etc. Are you telling me that God gave them eyes that are completely useless? Because that's what you're saying here. Without a single one of these parts, the human eye is completely useless. But there are animals with eyes that do not have all of the parts that the human eye has. Why would they need those eyes if they are completely useless? So if I grant this argument, it actually winds up being an argument against intelligent design. Because if the human eye is irreducibly complex, then no eye with any fewer parts than what the human eye has could possibly have any useful function. However, organisms exist with these eyes that are missing parts, so they have eyes that serve no useful function? Since an intelligent designer wouldn't put body parts on an animal that serve no useful function, the existence of these animals with such body parts demonstrates a lack of intelligent design. But no, that's actually quite ridiculous, which is kind of the point. Clearly, these eyes serve a function for the organisms that have them. After all, these organisms see out of those eyes. Maybe not as well as we do in some cases, like the Nautilus, but it is undeniable that they find their eyes to be quite useful, which demonstrates conclusively that the human eye is not irreducibly complex. On top of that, ours aren't even the best eyes in the animal kingdom. Eagles, for instance, have about four times the visual acuity of humans, have better color vision, and can see into the ultraviolet. Mantis shrimp have between 12 and 16 types of photoreceptors, giving them not only better color vision than us, but also allowing them to see into the ultraviolet and detect polarized light. They're actually the only known animal that can detect circularly polarized light. They can also adjust their sensitivity to different wavelengths depending on their environment. Like imagine changing the picture profile of your TV, but in your eyeballs. That is how a mantis shrimp do. Now admittedly they don't see the colors that we see very well, but I think the other features of their vision more than make up for that. So if we start with the mantis shrimp eyeball as our default irreducibly complex eye rather than the human one, you know, since it's more complex and just is generally better, then our human eyes must be completely functionless. Our eyes don't even have the mini brain structures that the mantis shrimp have. We need to process our visual inputs through our regular brain. What good is vision if we're forced to process the whole thing inefficiently through our main brain instead of directly in the eyes themselves? The answer, of course, is that it's still quite good. Because the mantis shrimp eye is not irreducibly complex. Neither is ours. I want to show you something. Okay. okay. Darwin made a statement. No, don't do it. Don't. Please. Please. Darwin made a statement that was a rhetorical device at the beginning of the bit where he explained how the eye evolved. That was meant to give the reader a sense of comfort, knowing that if they initially felt incredulous at the idea of an eye evolving, that they were not alone. Darwin felt that at first too. It's meant to vindicate the doubts of the reader while explaining why those doubts are unfounded. And as such, it is a terrible quote to use to argue against Darwin. Because this is why this matters, because people are like, why are they talking about eyeballs? I want to show you why this matters. Here's what Darwin okay. said. This comes from Origin of Species, the, basically the evolutionist Bible. Uh, the end all to be all to yeah. some people. Yeah. Nope. On the Origin of Species is not the evolutionist Bible. Well, unless by that you mean that most people that accept evolution haven't actually read it and only have a vague idea about what's in it. In which case, yeah, I guess you could say that. But no, nobody thinks that it's inerrant, nobody turns to it for life advice. Well, except maybe social Darwinists, but Darwin himself was rather against the position of social Darwinism, though creationists like to ignore that. They'll often quote from The Descent of Man, from right after how he describes various ways in which society cares for the weakest members, with medicine, vaccination, and asylums, which 19th century asylums wouldn't really count as care nowadays, but that's another issue. Anyway, he says, 
Thus the weak members of civilized societies propagate their kind. Nobody who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. It is surprising how soon a want of care or care wrongly directed leads to the degeneration of a domestic race, but excepting in the case of man himself, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. And yeah, that does seem quite damning. But keep in mind, Darwin was fond of using rhetorical devices where he would often state a position that he disagreed with as though it were quite a reasonable thing to think, immediately before explaining why he disagrees with it. So if we keep reading past that quote, we get to the part where he says, "...the aid which we feel impelled to give to the helpless is mainly an incidental result of the instinct of sympathy, which was originally acquired as part of the social instincts but subsequently rendered, in the manner previously indicated, more tender and more widely diffused. Nor could we check our sympathy, even at the urging of hard reason without deterioration in the noblest part of our nature. The surgeon may harden himself whilst performing an operation, for he knows that he is acting for the good of his patient, but if we were intentionally to neglect the weak and helpless, it could only be for contingent benefit with an overwhelming present evil. We must therefore bear the undoubtedly bad effects of the weak surviving and propagating their kind. He then continues on, explaining the various factors that could impact a weak person's ability to procreate, comparing it with a strong person in a similar situation. With several points that definitely cross the line into what we would consider racist and ableist today, but in the 19th century they were reasonably progressive. Anyway, that's kind of an unrelated tangent, let's hear the quote. Alright, so Darwin claimed that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find no such case. Okay, I was expecting the I quote, but that is another popular quote mine. Now, pro tip, you're supposed to stop before you get to the but I can find no such case part, because that gives the game away. He couldn't think of anything that could not be formed that way. Of course, that doesn't mean that such an organ doesn't exist, but over a century and a half later we still haven't found any. Sure, there are some things in evolution that we haven't quite figured out yet, but none of them show any sign of being unfigureoutable. Which, according to my spell check, is actually a word. Though again, I would like to stress that even if something is entirely impossible to figure out, that doesn't mean that intelligent design is automatically the answer. This is not an argument for intelligent design, this is an argument against evolution. It's not even an argument against evolution, but at its best that's what it would be. Intelligent design is not the default alternative. You still need to provide evidence for it that doesn't just amount to, but evolution isn't real though. Now we gotta cut him some slack, cause back then he didn't have all the resources and materials that we have yeah. now. Modern so technology. Exactly. Do you think we wound up with less knowledge somehow after studying it for 150 years? Like, since then we discovered DNA and genetics. Darwin had no idea what the mechanism was that determined which traits got passed on and which did not. Once we discovered the mechanism, it made explaining these gradual changes over time way easier, thus solidifying the case for evolution. It didn't have to. When we discovered the mechanism that passed traits on, it could have completely upended evolution and said, nope, this isn't how it works. But it did the opposite. So I'm sure he, he wasn't aware that the eyeball is irreducibly complex, yeah. our respiratory system is irreducibly complex, yeah. so a on blood so circulatory forth. system, yeah. or, a bird, or a bird wing. Okay, before criticizing Darwin for a lack of knowledge on these things, maybe try reading his book. He didn't go into a lot of detail for most of those, but he did suggest that the lung evolved from a swim bladder. And he was correct. He doesn't really say anything about the evolution of the circulatory system or the bird wing, at least not in Origin of Species, but the eye? He literally outlines exactly how he thinks the eye evolved by pointing to extant animals that he knew about that all contained eyes at varying levels of evolutionary development. On top of that, yeah, he didn't have the benefit of modern technology, but his ideas about the evolution of the respiratory system and the eye have been vindicated, and we have found evolutionary explanations for many other organisms that Darwin could only hope to speculate about. We have not in fact learned that any organs are actually irreducibly complex. Quite the contrary, we keep figuring out these explanations. I mean, right. honestly, and it feels like our whole body is that way. Exactly. Exactly. Well, when you speak about the body, did you know that there's a city inside of a cell? Really? There's a tiny yeah. microscopic yes. city. I mean, there's transport systems and energy factories and production facilities and waste stations and warehouses. No, there's chemical reactions. Now, in order to help students understand the various components of a cell, we do use these metaphors, but they are not literally cities. 
All of this has to function all at the same time. Inside of, we're talking one microscopic little cell, all of it has to be there working at the same time or else it doesn't work. And they think that happened by accident? Not by accident, no. Accident implies intentionality, and there was no intentionality. But yeah, cells developed through naturalistic processes, many of which we already have a pretty good understanding of. Like, Dr. Martin Hanchik created simple protocells which exhibit remarkably lifelike behaviors in his lab using only five chemicals. In fact, he actually pointed out that this would have been way too simple to have happened naturally. In nature, you don't get a pool of exactly five chemicals. You get mixtures of complex organic tar. So he did it again, but with more impure tarry substances that would more closely resemble what might have actually happened in nature this time. And he got simple little protocells that have a lot of the qualities that define life. They move, they have metabolisms, they sense and respond to stimuli in their environment, they even reproduce on occasion. This serves to demonstrate the fact that the chemical beginnings of life could have been relatively common, contained in chemical reactions that were happening all over the place. Of course, it wouldn't really be called life until it had some sort of genetic molecule allowing for the inheritance of characteristics to take place, and how that happened is one of the biggest unanswered questions in Origins research at the moment. But given how easy all the precursor steps to that genetic molecule are, it stands to reason that the early Earth had plenty of opportunity for such a molecule to develop in tandem with some form of protocell. And as soon as you have inheritance of characteristics, you have natural selection and evolution. The characteristics that help the proto-organism make more copies of itself will take over. This isn't an accident, and it isn't random. There is a degree of randomness involved in which characteristics develop, but the selection of the successful characteristics is most definitely not random. They think it happened over a period of time. But what if you had what if you had a, a cell and you didn't have the, the skin around it? The, it how is the cell? Apart. It just yeah. falls apart. So I mean, it's irreducibly complex. The skin around it is literally the easiest part. If you've ever seen oil droplets mixed in water, you've seen the beginnings of a basic membrane. Oil spontaneously forms little circular bubbles when mixed with water. Sure, that's not the same as modern cell membranes, but we're not talking about modern cell membranes. We're looking to see if modern cells are actually irreducibly complex. And it turns out that when you don't start with the assumption that it is, it's possible to actually figure out how it could have evolved over time. You see, the whole city analogy that you made use of when describing how complicated cell operations are is kind of apt. But the transport and delivery systems that figure out which molecules to take to which parts of the cells all work based on the self-organizing nature of lipids in aqueous solutions. Think back to the protocell experiments of Dr. Hanchik. The protocells seek out what he calls their food. By using similar methods inside a cell, membrane vesicles can travel to specific destinations based on the makeup of their lipid bilayers, as well as the various proteins that they contain. At its core, life breaks down to very simple chemical reactions and interactions. The complexity of life is not in the reactions themselves, it's in how they work together to form the gestalt that is the living organism. And the way this cooperation of blind chemical reactions happens is through the natural selection process. The chemical interactions that assist the larger cascade of reactions to continue are the ones that continue. The ones that don't work together cease to function. Correct. But I want to show you probably my favorite one, and that is this. But if I could convince you that this page right here, that ink's just going to magically fall from the sky and land on the page, and then it's going to organize itself into words, and then it's going to organize itself into yeah. sentences. Yeah. And then it's going to give me $500. And then it's going to get... <laughs> exactly. I mean, while we're wishing, I mean, we might as well. Could I convince you that this book wrote itself, meaning like, Colors fell down onto the paper and just organized itself in no. a, a written language. They're, they're... A book is the analogy that apologists always like to use for this, but it doesn't work. Does the book reproduce? No, it doesn't. Since it doesn't reproduce, selection pressures can't act on it. If it were to reproduce, is there a reason that those particular words written in that particular book in that particular order would be selected for? What is the advantage for that? Life is not analogous to a book. So using a book as an analogy for life will always be flawed. Now, language in general, though, that could be a decent analogy for how evolution works. Because language itself does evolve. I speak the same language as my kids. I can understand them when they speak, and they can understand me. But there have been some changes in just one generation where I know certain words and phrases that they don't, like dial-up and yellow pages, but they know certain words and phrases that I don't know. And even words and phrases that are common to us can change their meaning and usage over time. 
Kids today will often use the word verse as a verb, because of the lack of context that they've received when they've heard adults use it. They hear the phrase, the Bills versus the Jaguars, and since that means the team known as the Bills is going to play a game against the team known as the Jaguars, the word versus must be a verb that encapsulates that meaning. So then, after applying the normal English conjugation rules to the word versus, as if English has normal conjugation rules, you wind up with kids saying things like, who is our team versing in our next game? And while people of my generation will bristle at that, I mean, clearly it's grammatically incorrect, it was a natural and understandable change to the language. This specific example is a type of linguistic phenomenon known as a back formation, where new words or usages are created through the assumption that a given word is using a prefix or a suffix, and then applying typical grammatical rules with that assumption in mind to create the new word or usage. The classic example being the removal of the S sound from the end of P's to create the singular noun P. Now, using verse as a verb might not stick around, it's too early to tell, but if it does, then it will in the future be considered grammatically correct, and the language will have evolved. And through this slow evolutionary process, we can see how new languages form from the old ones. The average English speaker of today would find it difficult to read and comprehend English documents written just a few centuries ago, and just downright impossible to understand old English writings. Just look up Beowulf in its original Old English sometime. If you've never studied Old English, you won't be able to read it, despite it being a language that is very closely related to Modern English, and one from which Modern English is directly descended. Modern English didn't just show up one day with kids that spoke Modern English not being able to understand the Old English parents, and vice versa. It changed slowly over several generations. Now, of course, the problem that creationists will have with using language as an analogy here is that, despite how complex our language is, we can see very clearly that it is not, in fact, irreducible. We can fully picture how language could have originated from just grunts, with specific grunts eventually being used to refer to specific objects, and developing more complex grunts to be able to communicate more complex ideas as time went on, until you wind up with a fully-fledged language complete with grammar. Well, biological evolution develops complexity in much the same way. Not identical, but very closely analogous. There's oh, maybe if you effort. had enough time. Oh, psh, you, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a result with a chimpanzee time. who they're trying to get to type out to be or not to be, and they've yeah. been working on it for years and he can't yeah. do that. Again, a bad example that fails to take natural selection into account. If you were to sit a chimp in front of a typewriter, the chances are pretty much zero that the first 18 characters it types will make the sentence to be or not to be. But if we apply natural selection by giving the chimp many opportunities to type at this typewriter, and when he hits a letter that is in the correct spot, we keep that progress when moving on to the next attempt, then based on a typical 44 key typewriter, each attempt the chimp makes will give it a 1 in 44 chance of making progress toward the end goal. Given these odds, doing some quick and dirty probability math that's probably wrong, it would take approximately 1300 attempts for the chimp to end up with the sentence to be or not to be. But even this is a terrible example, because evolution doesn't have an end goal in mind. It wasn't trying to get to humans. It's just that things that make more copies of themselves do better than things that don't. And as the selection pressures change in an environment, the things that make those organisms better at making copies of themselves will also change. The ultimate guiding force for all of this is just the laws of physics. So if we take away the end goal of getting a specific sentence, and replace it with getting any grammatically correct sentence, with the rules of grammar being analogous to the laws of physics here, then any letter that the chimp presses that can potentially result in a grammatically correct sentence will be kept, while any letter that is impossible to make grammatically correct will be discarded. Now suddenly, it'll take far fewer attempts for this chimp to bang out an actual grammatically correct sentence, because we're no longer attempting to get to a specific sentence. Any sentence of any length will do. Because it requires intelligence mm -hmm. to organize the letters into sentences, gotcha. into paragraphs, into chapters. We know that it takes an intelligent mind. Well, no, you're conflating a part of what is supposed to be an analogous situation with reality. An analogy is supposed to be a comparison that helps you understand something. It is not supposed to be 100% accurate to that thing. So while I recognize that the rules of grammar are the invention of an intelligent mind, in this analogy they are representing the laws of physics. Now, you can feel free to ask how did the laws of physics come to be what they are, and you would be correct to say that the question has not yet been answered by science, so I guess you can put God in that gap if you want? But even if the laws of physics require a god to have made them what they are, that still doesn't disprove evolution. That just means that God designed the laws of physics to allow for evolution. 
Of course, there is no indication that the laws of physics were designed. This is just an assumption that comes from our lack of knowledge about why they are what they are. Also, it's helpful to keep in mind the difference between the laws of physics as humans understand them and the way the universe actually works. Because our laws of physics are descriptive. We create a mathematical equation that describes how the universe works in some specific way. If we learn something new that changes our understanding of these mechanisms, then our description of how the universe works is what changed, not how the universe actually works. Gravity has behaved as it does now since long before we ever conceptualized the laws of gravitation. Well, DNA is the most complex language that's out there. It only requires four letters, and yet DNA is the most complex. Yes. It dictates what every single thing is all the way around. Well, DNA is not actually a language. It's a molecule. Language is sometimes used as an analogy for the genetic code, but again, the genetic code describes chemical reactions. It's not actually a code or a language. And I know this has been a point of confusion for me in the past, so I'll lay it out here. DNA is just the genetic molecule, the double helix with the base pairs on it. The genetic code describes which sequence of bases results in the production of which amino acid. And while language does require intelligence, we can see that language has, in fact, evolved over time. So the best case scenario for you here is DNA is a language, language requires intelligence, but very obviously evolves, so God-guided evolution. But this is an overly generous interpretation of the argument anyway, so it really doesn't work no matter how you slice it. All of these things require an intelligent mind. They require an intelligent designer. Mm -hmm. But the intelligent designer has something really important to say about it. What's that? I'm thinking that we can read I it think, about in our scriptures. I, I, we haven't really gotten to an intelligent designer in the first place, much less a specific one that is found in the modern Christian interpretation of the Bible. So why would we turn to scripture at this point? Even if I grant all of your arguments up to this point, at best, that gets us to a god that set life in motion and then sat back and let it evolve on its own. Maybe with a little nudge here and there to send it in the desired direction, but without actually leaving any evidence of such nudges. Psalm 139, uh, 13 through 14, if you want to read along with us, says, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My that is a weird verse to use in support of intelligent design. Because that means that every time something goes wrong with a pregnancy, God is directly responsible for it going wrong. Every genetic defect someone has is because God put it there. Hell, that even means that God actively puts original sin into all of us as he makes us, not that it just somehow transfers through the generations. Because if he makes all of us individually, he could choose to correct whatever defect caused original sin, but he wants to keep it around for some reason. And yeah, you know all those genetic problems that we have that creationists like to blame on the fall? Well, turns out God makes every person individually, so could just not make them with those conditions. So this is either God fucking up, or God being malicious. I'm picturing God putting a person together grumpily, like, mm, I can't believe they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'll show you, just look at this genetic condition I'm gonna give you. That's what happens when you disobey me. My favorite part, knitted. Mm, yep. the, the fact that the author used knitted as the word, and when you look at the double helix shape of DNA, and you see that it looks like it's Literally. It looks like a stitch pattern. It yeah, looks like yeah, it stitching. Does. I mean, I guess if you squint hard enough? It's not exactly close, though. Also, the Hebrew word that is translated as knitting there doesn't mean knitting. Not like we mean knitting today, at any rate. That kind of knitting was invented in Egypt sometime around 500 CE, at the earliest. That specific Hebrew word in other places of the Bible is usually translated to mean cover, with many translations of the Bible rendering this verse as something along the lines of, You have possessed my reins, you have covered me in my mother's womb. Now, if we want to stick to a similar meaning as knit, it could also be translated as joined together, so maybe wove would be a good candidate, as that is something that the ancient Hebrews at least actually did. But this is all kind of needless pedantry. What it comes down to is that these guys are looking for deeper meaning or connection where none exists. We can turn to the Bible every single time and see that the Bible gets it right every time. Let us turn in the good book to Psalm chapter 104, verse 5. It says, he set the earth on its foundation, so that it should never be moved. 
Whoops. Whoops. Whoopsie. Science is constantly changing. Yep. Evolution's constantly changing, but the Bible gets it right every single time. Yeah, you know what? Science is constantly changing as we learn more about how stuff works. Y'all are sitting there using modern technology that would not exist if science didn't change. Using green screen technology to put yourselves into a poorly built, claustrophobic looking set for some reason. Using digital camera technology, using electricity, hell, using chairs that were made with modern manufacturing technology. All of which would not exist if science remained constant and unchanging. The changing nature of science is literally the whole fucking point of science. If you don't like it, feel free to discard everything that scientific progress has brought you. Normally I don't like to use the argument that, oh, you deny evolution, therefore you deny science, therefore you shouldn't use anything that science has produced, because you can use cognitive dissonance to deny parts of science while accepting that the same scientific method gave you all the technology that you use. But when you actively attack science for its changing nature, all while using a shit ton of stuff that exists precisely because of its changing nature, that's when I whip this one out. But Nick, we have barely cracked the surface on this answer. You haven't even cracked the surface. Hell, you didn't even get to the three points that you said you were going to get to. I counted two max, irreducible complexity and DNA is like a book. As I predicted at the beginning, there wasn't any positive evidence in favor of intelligent design. The irreducible complexity argument is at best an argument from ignorance. If you can't figure this out in an evolutionary framework, then it must be God. The second is an argument from incredulity. I can't believe this amount of complexity could happen naturally, therefore God. Now, yeah, I wouldn't give them too much flack for forgetting that they were supposed to be making a list though. I've done that myself a bunch of times. It's easy enough to do. Though I don't have a whole production team behind me, so you'd think that someone would have caught that. Also, I could just blame my ADHD for that one. I get lost in the first point in the list and never quite make it back to redo the part where I said I was making a list. Now, seriously, go back and watch my older videos and count how many times I start a point with something along the lines of, a few things here, firstly, blah 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 blah, and then I never get around to secondly. And no, this is not a trick to get you to binge watch my whole catalog. That would be mean, especially given the low quality of my older videos. Like, yeesh, my most viewed video on this channel is still the second video I ever made before I even used a photograph as a rhino as an avatar. That's embarrassing. Okay, if I need y'all to go watch one specific thing, it's my second most popular video. That one was from a couple years later and I actually kind of knew what I was doing by then. So I'll leave a card to that one. Everyone go watch that one so we can make it the number one instead of the one that actually is number one. Also don't look at number three. That's the one where I spent a huge chunk of the video talking about something completely irrelevant to the point I was trying to make because I misunderstood what the word critical scholar meant in the context of studying history. God, why are my worst videos the ones that everybody watches? Anyway, that's it for this one. I'm still amused at the fact that this guy is wearing a shirt that says because lies enslave but the truth sets you free, given that they are promoting creationist lies, and that the organizations like Reasons for Hope rely entirely on people believing the lies and feeling obligated to send the money to be in alignment with biblical tithing principles. Not to mention the trying to control other aspects of your life thing, like your sexuality, literally lying to people in order to exert a level of control over them. Meanwhile, the truth that there is no evidence for the Christian God will set you free from the pointless restrictions that Christianity places on your life. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Chables, who says, As a polyamorous person, I'm even more confused by the question of why does the church care so much about condemning aspects of my sexual habits that the Bible is totally on board with? Indeed, the Bible seems to be very much in favor of at least portions of polyamory, with men being allowed to have multiple wives. It's weird that people who want to argue that we should only allow traditional biblical marriages can never actually get a definition of marriage from the Bible. Instead they have to rely on that one verse about how a man will leave his father and mother and join with his wife, becoming one flesh. As though that says he only ever does that with one wife, which is clearly not the case given the rules about how you are to treat the wives that you take beyond the first. A traditional biblical marriage is not one man and one woman, it is one man and as many women as he could afford to support financially. Thanks for watching, thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, Thomas for being this week's PayPal hero, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Tim Springer, Aunt Allen, and all the rest, who are the piercings and tattoos that help me to appeal to the hip young folk nowadays. How do you do, fellow kids? What? 
If you'd like to help me stay trendy, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! shower why because you smell bad is there a reason that those particular words written in that particular burk burk read a burk read a burk would you but if we apply natural selection by giving the chimp many opportunities to type at this typewriter and when he hits a letter that is in the correct spot we keep it and keep that progress when we i can't blab such blibber blubber my tongue isn't made of rubber